It's Didi on the Spot. Welcome to another edition of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before I get to my guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, please give a like and subscribe down below. We greatly appreciate it. We have Casey Shepard here. She's the owner-operator at Spectrum Wellness. Casey, how are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? So what what got you started into fitness, and how has that, uh, how has that journey sort of been for you? Um, I got started into fitness actually my senior year of college. I played basketball on a full ride scholarship um, at Colorado State as a Division One school. And when I was done with basketball, I was like, okay, I need something else to train for. I had found out about all these food allergies and stuff. So it sort of happened when you go from eating whatever you want and mm-hmm. just training for more like, you know, performance and that kind of thing to like completely the opposite direction, but like still having that drive and something to train for. And so, yeah, like my senior year of college, I did my first show and that sort of like 2008 was really when I kind of got into it and got hooked on it. Mm-hmm. And um, that first show, I was just a skinny little thing. And <laughs> after that, I was like, I want to look like that girl, yeah. you know? And so I kept, just kept training, kept training. And um, I mean, it's crazy looking back at how long I've been doing it for 10 years now. Wow. Um, but yeah, I would say um, it's been awesome. Yeah. So I got to give everyone out there a little warning ahead of time that we're both from Minnesota. So when we're pronouncing our O's, it's going to be very prolonged and just giving everyone a heads up there. So if you if you have a hard time understanding, you can always just look at stuff up in the dictionary. But um, when you were getting started in bodybuilding, what was the hardest adjustment that you really had to make? Because it is different training for bodybuilding than it is for training just for sports. Yeah, I would say like the number one thing that I had to do, number one, obviously was put on muscle being six, two is just like, Mm -hmm. okay, you're long and lean, but you have those long muscle fibers. So you need to put on so much more just to look like everybody else Mm -hmm. that, but number two is, is that I am super blocky and like playing sports. I just didn't have any lats. I was just like, like blocky the entire way down. So I guess the biggest thing for me was like symmetry and trying to build my physique from, from my body type to make it, to create that illusion, right? That's what bodybuilding is, is creating that illusion to have that symmetry. And so I think that was like probably the number one thing that I needed to do was, was learn, you know, how do I bring these areas up and what do I need to do in order to look the way that I need to? And I started out as a figure athlete. And then when I started to build around my, my more blockier waist and frame, I ended up just getting too muscular to be in figure right about the time where they had just made the physique division. And so I just said, screw it. I'm just going to keep putting on muscle and switched over divisions and then turned pro a year later. So when it came to like your body adjusting to the new workouts, did you find that it adjusted fairly quickly or did it take a little bit more time for it to develop? You know, my freshman year of college, um, when I went in, I got like abnormally strong. Like I never lifted in high school and I was a pretty awesome athlete, but we just never concentrated on lifting weight. Mm-hmm. So when I got to college my freshman year, like obviously I was getting my ass kicked, but we were doing these, you know, compound movements and whatever. And my strength just went up like crazy. And I was hitting numbers that some of the seniors were hitting that had been, you know, training like this for years. And they actually even wrote an article about me in the newspaper my freshman year. But I always, like, I just loved that aspect of it. And I loved like getting strong and the only part that sucked was that we would lift and then we'd go practice for three hours afterwards. So then you're so tired. But, um, I guess the adjustments were like just slow and steady. I never was like, okay, I'm going to do this now. And it's going to be so different than anything I've ever used to. Because when I started out like in bodybuilding after I quit basketball, like I was reading oxygen magazine and muscle and fitness and like cutting out, you know, workouts and exercises and like piecing them together. And my first show I basically did, my own diet, my own training. And for a couple shows, I did it that way. And just, it was like one of those things where, um, I was super naive, but like back then it isn't like anywhere near where it is now because Mm -hmm. social media was like, there was Facebook and stuff, but you didn't have all all these coaches that were out there, like helping people prep for shows because it wasn't as big of a thing back then. Mm -hmm. And so you really kind of just like wing it and Mm -hmm. teach yourself how to do stuff and read as much as you can and research. But I really believe that that's how like I got better at stuff is I was able to try and do so many different things and just slowly time and put pieces together and add and take things away. And so, um, 
you know, not until years into it did I really just decide like, oh, I'm going to go on a program like this or like that or that kind of a thing. Yeah. How did you, I mean, like you mentioned before that the sport of bodybuilding has evolved a lot over probably the 10 years that you've been in it. Other than social media, what do you think is the big cause of that? Is it maybe just, I mean, social media did give it a lot more of exposure to a lot of people, but other than that, is there any other reason that you think uh, really helped in its surge in popularity? Um, I, I mean, obviously the social media thing, I think a lot of people do it for attention. I'm sorry to say, I really, I think they do. I think it's less about really loving competing and more about wanting a quick fix or just to look a certain way so that you can gain the attention that other people in the fitness industry have, or people now do the competing aspect so they can put it on their credentials for a social media profile and make money off of selling programs or, or being a coach. And I don't mean to be negative saying that that's the only reason, but you know, these, you look at the divisions for the sport of bodybuilding and you're going to see the men's physique and the women's bikini are the two sort of like bottom level, like mm -hmm. entry level things. And not to say that the people that compete in there don't work really hard, but if you lift some weights or, you know what I mean? Like have a good amount of muscle, you lean down, you could compete in either one of those divisions. And so you've seen those two divisions grow more than any other division in the sport because they're the easier ones to get started into. Mm -hmm. And then they stay there. They're not looking at progressing or whatever. Women's bodybuilding is totally gone. And, you know, it, so it's just that that part has become oversaturated mm -hmm. and just wanting to be a competitor, I would say. Yeah. Before I did my research and I found out that they that they did kind of get rid of women's bodybuilding. What was the reason behind that? Did they just think that they were getting way too muscular or, and they just wanted to change to well, a more like a more societal appearing look or what, what happened there? Yeah. So I don't know if you know back like but some of the first women's bodybuilders like mm -hmm. Corey Everson and some of those women, yeah. they demonstrated the look of like where women's physique sort of started out mm -hmm. back like seven or eight years ago when they first made the women's physique division. Um, that is what like they were going for is like going back to that, like sort of old school bodybuilding look where the women were, were more muscular, but they posed different and they had more feminine lines. Mm -hmm. The women's bodybuilders were getting so out of hand and so, big that they made that division for the women who didn't want to get that extreme, but like, we're still a little bit too big for figure like that mm -hmm. same place that I was in. Yeah. And so, but then as women's physique grew, you have a lot of these bodybuilders who are cutting down to then go into women's physique because the division was just losing, you know, sort of its steam. And mm -hmm. there was, you know, a few girls in each show. So they still do women's bodybuilding shows and stuff, but they don't even have it at the Olympia anymore. Oh, wow. Um, but now the women's, so then, you know, each class and division evolves over time. The men's, even the bikini girls that were first there look like Hawaiian tropic models. None of yeah. them even had any muscle tone. And now they're these hard, super shredded, you know, they look great. Mm -hmm. And then now the women's physique girls are, they look like the bodybuilders used to look. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, it's like sort of just transitioned back to that space anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, they always want the harder, leaner, yeah. bigger look. So, so. I was going to ask, I mean, I'm a tall person myself. I'm 6'2". Um, being a tall person, you kind of have to, it takes a lot more to maintain muscle being tall. How did you come to deal with that problem? Um, I guess I just took it as a challenge. Like, yeah. I was so focused on it for so long. And, like, when I turned pro, I mean, I don't know that anybody even really understands, like, height versus weight, whatever. Mm -hmm. I was, like, 162 pounds, which was really small for being 6'2". Um, and back then it's kind of what the women's physique girls looked like, but I was at that time told like, yeah, you need to put on some more muscle, which I was completely fine with. I had lost some muscle that prep because I was really lean for a long time, like getting ready for that show. So I had no problem like putting some on, but then it was one of those things where, um, I did take two and a half years off after I turned pro mm -hmm. to put the time into putting muscle on. Um, and then I did, you know, a few few pro shows in a row after that within like eight months of each other but then I ended up being 25 pounds heavier at my next show oh wow so for me I've always been must like muscular naturally just my whole mm -hmm. life even before I lifted I've always had just more of that like genetically mm -hmm. you know but then it was just taking the time to like eat enough and train hard and put in the time in the off season um and now after my last show I actually retired after my last show in 2015 oh, wow. um it was sort of my goal to start cutting back down the muscle mm -hmm. because I got sick of then being 
too big and bulky and yeah. feel like the middle man at like six two in the off season, you know. So <laughs> um I found it to be almost harder to lose the muscle now that I like took the time to, you know, when you put it on the right way, you're not going to just lose it like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you train hard and you, you eat correctly and you gain that muscle like in the right way. It's going to be a lot harder to get it off than you would think. And I love to lift heavy and train hard, but now my body's just like, boom, like wants to put it on and like hold mm-hmm. it there. So, um, that's definitely changed now that I've decided to switch directions yeah, so what one thing that people don't realize is that when you change into even get into the bodybuilding lifestyle in particular, it's a complete mindset change. Like it, it becomes a whole entire new life that you were it's it's training and it's proper nutrition. When you retired from that, how hard was it to kind of readjust to kind of having a more balanced uh balanced lifestyle as opposed to when you were training all the time for bodybuilding? You know, I struggled with a number of different health issues like through after turning pro and stuff. And so a lot of the reason that I took a lot of time was to just like get my body back into a healthy place and like rebalance itself. Um, and by the time I was done with my last show, I just didn't feel like it was the same as it used to be. Like I was constantly stressed out. I was constantly picking myself apart. I was constantly like depleted and running on E slamming caffeine. I just didn't feel like I was in that super healthy place with everything. Mm -hmm. And so when I quit, I was, I was okay with just feeling good again and like getting back to being motivated for no other reason than just like loving the way that it felt, but not like having to do it to get on stage or having a goal. So I took that as like a different sort of challenge Mm -hmm. in my mind was to like rebalance my system, get healthy. And then, Hey, like feel lighter again and more athletic, like how I used to be when I play basketball or like Mm -hmm. in my earlier years of competing and just like, that was like my new challenge. And so like, I still set those goals and have those goals, but like it does, you have to keep yourself accountable in a different way. And a lot of people do struggle with that, the clients that I train. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I did go through that for a long time. Competing was the only way I could really keep myself in that like good place. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it actually, it wasn't by the time I decided I was done, it wasn't hard for me. Yeah. What was, what was the hardest thing about your prep whenever you'd enter it? And by the way, people prep is when you're preparing for a bodybuilding show for those of you that don't know. Um, I would say like all my preps were very different. Um, my first pro show was absolute hell. Um, I had a lot more weight to lose to get ready for that show. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with some, um, imbalances in my system and stuff. And so, I mean, I think I went 25 weeks on prep with, zero cheat meal, you know, constantly taking calories away, adding more cardio. So I think just, but I, you learn to like love Mm -hmm. that discipline and like love the struggle of it almost. It's sort of like a sickness Mm -hmm. where you, you enjoy that pain. And and in the moment, like if you were like, Hey, tomorrow you're going to only eat this much food and you're going to go, you're going to do two hours of cardio a day and whatever you'd be Mm -hmm. like, I don't know. But like when you start off in a certain way and continue to progress that stuff, like in your mind, you're just like, all right, whatever I need to do, mm-hmm. you know, and I hired prep coaches for my, for my two of my pro shows when I was doing it because I do it for everybody else and I didn't want to think about it and I don't want to overanalyze and I didn't want to guess. And so I just, you know, I've had down go, but the, the hardest part is just being tired, yeah. like low calories, all that cardio day in and day out. Like it was like, a, it was the headspace I was in at the time and it was, it was fine. Yeah. So what was, I mean, most people don't realize that when you do go to a show, uh, all these people that they look great, they're all tanned up and they're all bronzed. Um, they're actually in the weakest condition I've heard at least that they're usually in. And when it comes to prep, like if you were to have them do like a, like a competition, like a benching competition or whatever, they would probably be at the weakest. What, what does that go into? Is that just from the body being worn down a lot from, uh, dieting is, or is it just a kind of just, they're just depleted from just working out a lot? Um, a little bit of both. Usually towards the end, your calories are going to be a little bit more restricted. Um, and a lot of it has to just do with being at unnatural levels of body fat, right? Mm -hmm. So like your body fat gives you energy and it helps keep the body's hormone levels balanced in terms of stress and cortisol and all those things. And so, especially like as a female, let's say like you're getting like for me, you're down at six and a half percent body fat. Your body obviously doesn't (laughs) feel good at that level. It's not normal. And so your body is fighting that like Mm -hmm. homeostasis, like all the time. So even just being in general is 
lean in general is hard on your system, regardless of even how hard you're dieting. If you're that lean and you're eating a lot, even still eating a decent amount of calories, it's still like hard on your system to be there because it's like abnormal. Yeah. So. So we have a lot of uh, up and coming or we have a lot of bands and up and coming musicians on the show. And I like to ask them what it's like performing live. And I think kind of the same question applies too for bodybuilding. What is that feeling like when you step on the stage? What is it like to finally be able to show off all that hard work and dedication to like hear people cheer? Does it make it all worth it for you? Um, you know, I never did it for the show day itself. Mm -hmm. Like it was kind of fun to see that polished look and like majority of the time when you're in a prep, you're living in sweatpants with your hair up and not doing your makeup or anything. So it's like, it's so fun the day of the show to like look pretty and have this like gorgeous expensive suit on and like show off that hard work. But, um, for me, it was just more of like, I loved the end result of like how I looked on the day of a show. And then you sort of learn to love the performing part of it to just show your personality and stuff. But for me, it was more so just um, the training itself and the changes that you see in your body. It wasn't as much that like I loved getting up on stage in front of everybody. <laughs> did so. you did you find that being uh, as tall as you are more of a detriment or a benefit to you when it came to like the judging and in, in your placement in uh, bodybuilding? Um, I would say more of a detriment. Like when I turned pro, my class was the tall, like class D, which is the tall class, and it was five seven and above. So I'm just like still five seven in bodybuilding is considered tall for women, and then I'm a good like you know seven or eight inches taller. <laughs> yeah. The rest of the girl in that class, so I'm I'm always gonna stick out. Mm. And some people could see that, like some judges might see that as like a really great thing, but like sometimes it's like, okay, you're too far abnormal for like what the criteria is mm -hmm. even if I had the symmetry or whatever it's just like you don't look n you know normal mm -hmm. and I always use that as to my advantage I, it wasn't like you know I I wanted to just stand out in my own way and be different and even when I started competing there was a lot of people that were like you're too tall like your symmetry is never gonna get there and I didn't do it for other people I did it because I strived for a physique that looked like what some other people had mm -hmm. um but I would say because I'm longer and taller, I just stick out in a different way that might not always draw the right attention for the sport. And uh, last, lastly about bodybuilding, one of the things that people don't really talk about is the, the crash that can happen usually afterwards when you, your body's not going to stay that lean, like you said, uh, for as long as you, as long as you want it to be. I mean, it's going to go through periods where then as soon as you're done with the show, you're not going to stay like that. So it's going to gain all that, a lot of weight back. How do you deal with that mentally when it comes to the fact that you know that you're not going to be this lean forever? Um, I think it's, I think it was initially hard. Like my first couple of shows, I had a really hard time with it. Um, but then as I got better and better at managing myself after, like you sort of learn the hard way, like, Hey, I can't put on 30 pounds in a month from binge eating after your show and like have some self control. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of that came with more experience of like reverse dieting after a show and like slowly bringing your calories up and like having some self control, you know, and it, and it is hard because you'll never feel the same way about the way that you look after you compete in a show and get that lean like people will be like oh my gosh you look so great or whatever and in your mind you feel fat because mm -hmm. you you know what i mean and not like still but just your your baseline changes for your expectations for yourself regardless mm -hmm. of how long you've been in it you still don't ever see yourself you know the same way again after you've been that lean because you know what lean feels like yeah so it's it's and then, and then a lot of people will they'll go up a little bit and then they freak out and then they can't control the eating. And so it's just, it is a mind game for yeah. sure. So now you were also able to turn this into sort of a business. You are like we announced before, you're the owner operator at spectrum wellness. How did you get into that? And uh, how's, how's that been going? Um, it's been a very long, slow road. I would say um, in college, I graduated with a degree in human development and family studies and my passion for nutrition started probably like my junior year. And at that point I had quit giving up my scholarship out of, and then was paying out of state for two years, oh, wow. had all the wrong prerequisites to do any sort of nutrition, health, kinesiology. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to finish up with this. I knew I wanted to work with people in some regard. So, you know, the, the degree that I did get wasn't, you know, totally wasted, but, um, I ended up moving back home to Minnesota when I graduated and, you know, most of the, um, 
careers in the health and fitness where either you're a trainer or you go work for some like corporate wellness of some kind mm-hmm. while well, they require to have a kinesiology degree or to have, you know, that nutrition degree, which I didn't have. So I just became a trainer and I started training and I was at some big gyms for a few years. And, um, to be completely honest, I hate working for other people. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always disagreed with the way that they, um, had their sales, approach and pushing certain nutrition supplement sales and packages. And, um, you know, when you're at a big club, all you do is you have that time to train that client and then there you send them off. You don't have time to sit and work with that client on what are you doing when you're not with me? And like, what type of eating are you doing and all that stuff? You don't get paid for that and you don't have the time to do that. You're just back to back clients. And I, and I do love training people in person, but a lot of Um, what I enjoy doing is the coaching aspect, everything as a whole, like putting it all together. And I'm super analytical. So I love to just dive in and, and do all those things. So it was something that just like sort of evolved over time when I finally left, um, by the last corporate gym that I was at, um, was in 2010. And so then I just started training clients on my own and then sort of over time developed more of the online coaching stuff along with the in-person training. And now I offer like a lot of different packages, but it's been something that's evolved over time. Turning pro definitely helped my status in there, which wasn't, was sort of indirectly happened. It wasn't like, Oh, I wanted to turn pro to like help my business, but it sort of just all did and get my, get my name out there. But really it's been one of those things where it's word of mouth and it's, you have to develop a reputation over time. And, you know, I do have a niche, with some of the things that I do offer with my business. And so like getting that out there and people to get those results and see that and refer, you know, that takes time. So, yeah. What do you think is the biggest obstacle the average person faces that keeps them from adapting a more healthy lifestyle? Um, I think that people are so used to doing certain things. They're afraid to change. Mm -hmm. I think I always say that, um, if you truly don't, want it you're going to sabotage yourself in every aspect like most people can't picture themselves in that healthier place Mm -hmm. and not that they like have to be able to see what it'll do but if you do if you can't really want it or picture yourself in that place you will sabotage yourself in the process because you don't believe that you can do it to begin with um and then when it comes to like the food stuff which is obviously the hardest part for most people Mm -hmm is changing that diet aspect is I will say you always will continue to crave the things that you continue to give your body. Mm -hmm. Your body's not just going to one day decide it doesn't want it. So I always say the more you stop giving into what your body wants, the easier it will be to not crave or want those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just honestly sticking it out for some people. And, And a lot of people think too, like that they get so bored. And so people just need to be more creative and like, do more research on recipes and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. People are just so stuck in sort of the way that they've been doing things for so long. They're afraid to change it. They're afraid to sacrifice certain aspects of their, of their lifestyle in order to get healthy. Um, But like when business people come to me and talk about how hard that is and I'm like, well, how did you, how did you build your business? How did you get to where you are today and become great at what you do? you sacrificed a lot of time. You maybe sacrificed some social events. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things you did that you didn't want to do, but you, you knew that the end goal would be worth it. And so you persisted to do that. And so I try to relate things to people from like a health and fitness standpoint for the same thing, but it all comes down to what is it worth for you to be doing? Uh, the fitness industry is also known for constantly evolving. It's if you look at it, even from the past thirty years, just where it was then, as opposed to where it is now, and all like the five year increments, it's, it changes vastly. How do you? How are you able to keep up with the trend? Uh, and do you have any tips on how to kind of get into the next uh, the next big thing when it comes to training? Is uh, are there techniques that you use in order to be able to gauge that so you can be more successful? When you say trend, what do you mean? Like the next big trend? Well, they have like, um, there's different, different ways of like working out. They'll come up with like a new fitness machine to come up with, or there'll be a new thing. Like there'll be CrossFit coming out or there'll be a new different, there's, there's always different styles of training that constantly people come up with that try to say like, Oh, this is more effective than the last one. Like there was always that, like that seven minute abs thing. Well, then they'll come out and say like, Oh, you can do that. Right. What are some of what are some keys that you'd say in order to be able to identify the ones that are actually going to work and be able to um, make uh, make them successful for your clients? 
I would say I'm not opposed to like evolving and learning new things. And when there's certain things that come out that are getting a lot of hype, I'll definitely look into them because I'm not going to like discount something that I've never completely researched or looked into. Um, but I think when it comes to the evolution of exercises and, and even diets, so you see the, the keto and the mm-hmm. fasting and all this stuff lately, a lot of it comes down to money. Like people want that new, like, you know, hype word that comes out and, if you have that, they're searching for it and then they're going to pop up. And I think a lot of it just comes down to basics. Like people lose the basics. And I think they think that if there's this new thing that it's going to make the process easier and everyone's looking for an easier way to do things all the time. You know, what is this new fat burner? What is this new diet? What is this new exercise? that's going to give me these abs quicker than anyone else ever has been able to. I mean, people have been getting lean and in shape for years. No one's ever had issues with it. Mm -hmm. It's just more that people are looking for an easier way to do things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I would say um, I will look stuff up and use things, but I'm not concerned because I feel like what I do works with people and I'm okay with doing things more basic and just more analyzing things as they go along and less of the special new exercise. And I think there's some different cool variations, but when you have girls upside down doing single leg whatever on Mm -hmm. the most random machines it's like okay you guys are doing this for more of a Mm -hmm. you know so so when it comes to one of the big issues i think that still exists in even the fitness and wellness area is that women still i mean it's gotten a lot better and especially probably i'd say in the past 10 years but they still have that fear of lifting weights because then they always have the excuse of they don't want to get bulky they don't want to get too big and yeah. we all know that that's, I mean, a lot of people know that that's a myth, but what, what techniques do you, or what do you tell someone who usually comes up to you and says that? Uh, well, I've had people that like meet with me mm-hmm. and they'll like sort of like backdoor, try to like nonchalant, basically say they don't want to be as big as me, mm-hmm. but they still want to like get in shape. And I'm like, yeah. little do you know how much training it exactly took mm-hmm. where I am, you know, unless you're like dieting to bulk or gain people say they get bulky when they start lifting. It's because they're not dieting correctly. Like Mm -hmm. if you are eating like crap and then you start lifting, of course you might like be swollen and like watery. If you're putting on muscle, like underneath fat, you're just going to get like sort of bulky looking. If you're putting on like lean muscle while you're lifting and following like a good nutrition program, really, honestly, you can't gain more than like five pounds of muscle, five to 10 pounds of muscle in an entire year. And like a pound of muscle is literally like, smaller than the size of my fist. Yeah. So the the amount that you're actually going to be bulked up from something like that is pretty, pretty slim to none. There are some women who've got the craziest genetics. Mm-hmm. They're the women who are going to already look that way without lifting. You yes. know what I'm saying? Those, so, lucky, those lucky SOBs. <laughs> yes. And yes. then there's guy, the guys too. Oh yeah. But, yeah. But like in terms of women, like, and, and, and I think it comes down to how they're training and mm-hmm. how they're eating and stuff too. But I think it's sort of a cop out. My my dad has a friend from college. I always like to t- tell this story when people talk about it, it's it's what you eat. But this guy, he eats probably like five or six candy bars a week. He doesn't eat anything healthy. The guy has the most one of the most pronounced six packs I've ever seen in my entire life. He eats like crap, but it's just his genetics. And I'm he's the luckiest yeah. human being. But he's the one in a trillion basically that he can eat whatever yeah. he wants and it doesn't affect him and. I, I know that there has been some cases where, like, there are some... I saw this little documentary. I watched a little bit of it. Or these kids are born with, like, some gene that causes them to have, like, super big muscles, like, more muscular development oh. than other people. And yeah. it just causes their metabolism to be really sped up. And I just found that to be really, um, really kind of interesting. And a lot of people don't know that, too, that it, it, genetics does play a, a big part of it as much as people don't want to oh, yeah. hear it. Because people are going to want to say, oh, it's fair or whatever. But nope, some people are just born to be yeah. more muscular than others. And what is your biggest, um, what once a lot of people also kind of seem to want to take the easy way when it comes to losing weight, they'll just have a lot of diet pills or they'll, they'll do it in the wrong way, which will then only make them gain it back. Cause they haven't learned the proper techniques. When someone comes up to you and says like, Oh, I just want to lose 50 pounds or whatever. And I'll take, I'll do this. What do you kind of tell them to kind of get them to maintain a more healthy approach and just say like, no, you aren't going to be able to maintain that. What are some ways that you use to try to convince them? Like maintain like a really lean, lean look, you mean? Or, or... just maintain like a healthy weight loss or as opposed to like someone who just like gets like uh, maybe let's say like a gastric or they get some other extreme thing oh. where they lose a lot of weight and then, but then they're probably going to gain it back because they don't have the techniques down to maintain right. it. 
Well, I tell everybody, like, most people who, most people have at one point lost a significant amount of weight by trying something. Like, the Atkins was, like, the huge thing back, like, with a lot of the mid or, like, to older generation. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a huge thing. And these people, like, cut out all their carbs and lost, like, all this weight. Well, most of them ended up gaining it all right back plus some. So I try and explain it to people where it's, like, from a metabolic standpoint and, like, you can crash diet and lose a, a lot of weight, but some people come to me and their metabolism already sucks. And so if you come to me and your metabolism sucks already, I need to, through food and workouts, bring your metabolism back up so that you're burning at a high rate. So then as we go along, we can take food out and manipulate things to actually get you to drop. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those diets are so restricted to, to drop that the metabolism ends up crashing with it. And then by the time that they're done, you know, where they get to their goal or wherever they're at, their metabolism is so low that any amount of like normal eating or they'll be like, oh, I had a cheat meal and I put on like eight pounds afterwards. It's because your metabolism isn't high enough to like burn it off or to continue going. So there's so much that you're doing at like a cell or like metabolic way that like if you do it in the right way like they say do it the right way well that's why is because you need to keep your metabolism going so that when you get to that goal it's a lot easier to maintain that and continue and and have some you know indulgence here and there and have your cheat meals and to just keep working out and have a better balance with it and not only that but like when you're crash dieting it affects your hormone profile your cortisol your stress then people fly off the rail because they're craving so bad and their stress is up and you know so it just there's many reasons what are some uh, tips that you have in order to deal with cravings? Because that's just a huge part of what people – I think that's one of the big reasons why people aren't have a lot of difficulty with their diet. Uh, are you one of the people who prefers just indulging every once in a while or are you a lot more strict? What's your philosophy on that? I, I think it depends on what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Like with my clients who are prepping for shows, like I use cheat meals as sort of a – as a tool, not necessarily like, oh, I'm giving you this because you can't handle like dieting. I use it more as like, hey, we need to give your metabolism a bump. Like, let's have you do like a cheat meal, you know, keep it to one meal with a dessert or something like that. Um, and use it more as a tool to keep the metabolism going. In terms of where I'm at right now currently, like I think like a once a week indulgence for me, like helps my metabolism and keeps me going. But everybody is so different. And a lot of people can't put a cap on like the one meal or like one day cheat meal thing, they feel guilty and that goes into a second day and then, then they get unmotivated and they feel like they've thrown everything away. And so then it spins out into all these things. So what I usually say is if you're going to do a cheat meal is to plan it ahead and to not do it in the moment because you're going to have a stressful day at work or you're going to be around some cake. And in that moment, you're just like, Oh my gosh. And it's usually like, you know, a stressful day or an emotional, like some sort of emotional tie. But if it's in the moment, it's typically not like something that you actually need. Mm -hmm. So I tell people like plan it ahead of time. That way you like forego the guilt that's associated with it. And then you're not like do overdoing it too often. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, uh, things that can be stressful about being a trainer and helping people, but then there's also a lot of benefits when someone comes to you and they've lost weight and you and you know that you've actually changed them and changed their lifestyle and made them feel like a better person, what does that feeling mean to you? And does is that does that make everything, all the struggles worth it for you? Yeah, I mean, that's the reason I do it. Like I told you, I went, I've been through a lot of stuff personally, and I've worked with a number of coaches, some bad ones, some good ones. I've been able to take like my experiences and and use it for the way that I work with people and and how I do my programs and my diet or how I communicate with people and and keeping them actually healthy and avoiding mistakes that I made for many many years you know through things and so yeah when someone sticks with it and, and stays consistent and listens to you and realize that they don't know everything and they trust you and they put their trust in you and then they they see that it is it is it is why I do it and um it took me a long time to figure stuff out. And so if I can help anybody, you know, get past all the crap that I had to go through mm -hmm. and make it any easier on them, then that, that makes me super happy. Cause it was, it was a lot of stress for a long time. Okay. 
All right, now we're going to go to our uh, questionnaire part of the podcast. This is our most famous part where I ask questions and we get answers and we, we make it a little bit of fun on here. So since this is the first bodybuilder that we've had on and with a emphasis on health and fitness, I thought that I'd mix up the questions a little bit. We've had uh, people on before that were in the health and fitness, but these are going to be a few more specific ones just for K- uh, Cassie. Uh, Casey, sorry, Casey, <laughs> I got it wrong. But um, so for the first one here, what is your go-to workout song? Um, I can say I don't have a specific song, but I'm a huge EDM fan, mm-hmm. and so um, like Spotify is my favorite, and they like mix your music and stuff for you. Mm-hmm. So I love all things EDM. Like I need a fast beat. I'm not a country fan or anything, so <laughs> like any of that, any of that realm, I love. Yeah. All right, and then if there was a celeb that you could train, who would it be and why? That I could train with or that I could train? That you could train. Um, I don't know if I could say, like, a specific celebrity, <laughs> but, like, there's a lot of these celebrities that you see on, like, Instagram and stuff working out with their trainers, and they're doing these, like, pansy workouts with mm-hmm. little dumbbells. I would just, like, love to take any of those celebrities and bring them through, like, a real hard workout where they're doing like compound movements and some sled work and like that kind of stuff. Like none of this like t- tiny little dumbbell stuff in your garage with a BOSU ball. You know what I mean? And they, and they get all the praise and they're like, Oh my God, so great for you. Like it's so hard, so much hard work. And then they go on these talk yeah. shows and they talk about like how, yeah. how hard it is or whatever. It's like, no, come on. Let's be honest. You know, I always wonder like some of these celebrity trainers that are out there and stuff. And like, you'll see some of these celebrities that go on this like cayenne lemon juice cleanse to lose five. It's like, I could take somebody and drop them five pounds in a week if they were just following something more like like a bodybuilding diet, mm-hmm. even though they weren't training for that, didn't have the muscle. It's like there's so many easier ways to like drop weight quick than to like go on some fasted cleanse. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, but. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it is. I do look at those things to myself, and I say like. They they really overdo a lot of things when it comes to just – I think they're just trying to advertise products and they're just trying to get on the yeah. new big things so that they can still remain relevant in the popular sphere. But it's – yeah, if they would have just maintained a normal normal workout routine, they'd have results that are just as effective. Yeah. So for our third question, if there's a person dead or alive who you could work out – it could be either one dead or alive, by the way – that you could work out with, who would it be and what would you train? Um, I actually think – Dwayne Johnson would be like super fun to mm-hmm. train with because he's like super hardcore. Yeah, and he's really good looking, so that would also be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what would we train? Um, I don't know. I love training legs, but I also love training like back. Mm-hmm. But back is probably like one of my strongest, and mm-hmm. I would not want to be a pansy around him. So I probably <laughs> back with him so that I could hang. <laughs> plus, he'd be taller than you too, so that's a plus too. I thought he was like six two. Is he six three? I think he's like six four or six five. Oh, I didn't think he was that tall. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no. I, and I was going to ask you this question earlier on, but um, if yeah. there was one thing that you could change about bodybuilding, what would it be? Um, what would I change about this? How this like the sport in general, or like the? It could it I could think, be either one. It could be both. I think I, with like the how things are now, I would. I would say I would love to like bring it back to how things used to be with like the less things just keep getting bigger and bigger Mm -hmm. and people are getting more unhealthy and more unhealthy. Like there's been so many more people who have like died in the sport in the last couple of years because people keep pushing that envelope like more and more. And it's really the reason I got turned off is because I just didn't want to keep putting on muscle, you know, and I just feel like people are getting more unhealthy in this sport because they just keep pushing it Mm. higher and higher so i I would love for that look to stay consistent but it's like people love freaky and huge and you know things that look unnatural Mm -hmm. and so that's what gains the most popularity so it's like i think they always try to like bring it down but then it always ends up like going back to opposite direction yeah now obviously i think there's a limit when it comes to how much like a human being can like physically put on do you think that eventually we'll reach that limit and then uh people kind of have to figure out then what to do then or do you think that there'll always be like some ways then that people can figure out like how to get even bigger what's your opinion on that um well you're talking about some of the guys that are in the pro leagues i mean they're they're obviously taking some things well yeah yeah um yeah so i mean they i've read plenty of forums and things about 
what they're finding now and taking and these people are expanding the, their organs and everything mm. in their body, not just their muscles. You know what I mean? You yeah. know, so they're taking these things that they give freaking Scottish cattle that are like <laughs> hulked out running around, you know, and these people are experimenting with it. So, um, I think these are the people that really just don't care about their health at mm-hmm. this point. They live and breathe for the sport of bodybuilding because they don't have anything else mm-hmm. to have to look forward to. And like, I just, I think it's stupid, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, like what's, what's it worth? I, I suppose that for them is. Yeah. I was going to say, because like, I, I like with those Scottish cattle that you were talking about, or even those cows or those, all those other types of things that they have where they just use them just to have more meat so that they can, so that they don't have to breed as many. I I did have a fear that kind of like human beings might kind of get onto that stuff and be, and there are a lot of people that would be willing to do that. Or there are a few people at least because they'd just be desperate enough and they'd be like, Oh, I just want to do it for the shock value too. I don't care what happens to my health. And then I just, I just, yeah, I think that that could be a dark thing, especially with the way that medicine and science is advanced these days. Who knows? Maybe 10, 15 years from now, there there, there probably is going to be someone like that. And it's going to be, or those stupid people that inject like synthol into their arms so that they can get like these 40 inch arms and then their arms explode and then they wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So where can people find you? Um, if they want to get in contact with you for training, uh, I know that you have, uh, do you have a Facebook page for uh, Spectrum and Wellness? Uh, Spectrum Wellness. Uh, do you guys have a website? Where can they contact you if they want to get in shape? Yeah, um, I have. I have everything. So I have a Spectrum Wellness business page on Facebook. Um, my Instagram is C Shepherd IFBB, um, and my website is SpectrumWellness.biz. Biz. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have a link to my website right on my Instagram profile, mm-hmm. and then they can contact me through the website. I've got like a lot of before and after is what I offer for programs, that sort of thing. But, um, the things that I offer aren't just the getting in shape part. I do a lot with hormone balance, gut function. Um, a lot of the stuff that I struggled with for years that a lot of people have issues with, you know, fighting against an imbalanced system of any kind is going to make the process 10 times harder. So that's something that I really dive into with clients. And I work with a lot of clients who are just trying to get their system in balance and lose weight at the same time. So I, I do offer a lot of different things. Online coaching, I work with out of country clients, out of state clients, in state clients, in person, mm-hmm. online. So yeah, well, everyone out there, I mean, I definitely recommend even even if you don't need to get in shape, following her on Instagram, you will be inspired. You will want to put those Twinkies down and get into some more weights. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's very inspirational and. It, it was great having you on. I mean, I recommend everyone Spectrum Wellness if you're in the Twin Cities area and you want to get in shape for sure, or if you're out of state for sure, get in contact with her. I mean, there are a lot of people that have all these voodoo stuff that they'll offer you, these voodoo training regimes, these voodoo workout things that they're just going to not really benefit you that much in the long run. But I think uh, Casey here really has, really knows her stuff and she'd really benefit you. So if you are looking to lose some weight, I, I highly recommend contacting her. I mean, and again, it was great having you on the show. If you need, if you need anything with spectrum wellness, when it comes to promotion, or if you need any, like if you have any releases that you want me to do, you can just shoot me a message and I'd be more than happy to. And, uh, thanks again for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So this is DD on the spot, Ryan Johnson signing out. Have a great night, everyone.